Welcome to the 21 Convention Podcast. My name is Steve Maeda, and today we have a very special podcast for you. It was actually shot at the 21 Convention in Tampa, Florida, and today we have a co-host, Skylar Tanner, also from Austin, Texas, and he will be interviewing Bill DeSimone, as well as Dr. Doug McGuff. What they get into here has to do with only what a friendship can actually propel in a conversation. We talk a lot about uh, the paleo lifestyle, the developments happening in the world, exercise, fitness, and the overall idea about being the ideal man. 21 Convention 2014 here in Tampa. My name is Skylar Tanner. I am your special guest host for this podcast. With me to my right is uh, Dr. Doug McGuff, who had a great talk today. To my left, Bill Simone, who's been uh, training people about as long as I've been alive. Yeah, yeah as long sure. as I've been, uh, yeah, 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 and based on uh, talks yesterday. So what we're going to do is uh, kind of a, as a point of interest, 10 years ago, roughly, uh, I had the honor and kind of just privilege of sitting kind of as a bird's eye view, fly on the wall of these two talking about some stuff at a different high intensity training conference. And, and here we are again, 10 years later, not much has changed, and yet so much has changed. Um, so what we'll do is that we're going to talk, kick it off because today Doug talked about, uh, talked about stress and how he handles it in the ER, and you'll find a link down in the bottom. And we're going to talk about what Bill's going to talk about tomorrow, which I'm sure you'll find a link down in the bottom here. And so, uh, Doug, kind of give us a 30,000 foot view of what you talked about today um, for, the, for the viewers out there. Well, I wanted to give, and you know, I was sick of talking about HIT. And I also thought that it was so well, well represented here. Sure. Better talks than I could give were going to be given. So I thought, eh, what else can I talk to these poor guys about? And I thought, well, you know, all I got to be in an ER doc. Um, but I've li listened to a, um, an educational lecture that these two guys had given on the cognitive processes of functioning when the shit hits the fan in the ER. And I thought, eh, maybe this is something these guys could really get into is just seeing what the process of when you're in a really stressful situation, how to handle it, how to not freak out, and what the cognitive tricks are for being able to function well in a high stress environment and get out of it without damaging your psyche or damaging yourself in the process. In, in all of that review of uh, what you kind of built up to putting together, were there, were there processes that you're using that you didn't, that you kind of had in process put together throughout your career and then realized, oh, this is represented in the literature yeah. and called something else. Yeah, this was not a de novo thing on my <laughs> part. Like, nothing I've ever done is a de novo thing on my part. I've always kind of just picked it up from other people, and the same is true here. You kind of go through this process of learning how to do it just by doing it, um, doing it wrong for a while and really feeling the stress, and then gradually getting a process of learning how to do it without feeling so much subjective stress. But I listened to a lecture that was given um, on a podcast called MCRIT, E-M-C-R-I-T, um, which is an emergency medicine critical care podcast run by this brilliant guy named Scott Weingart. And he interviewed a guy that's currently a medical student that used to be a pararescue PJ for the Air Force. Um, on just the um, cognitive processes of operating in high stress environments and how they use um, stress inoculation and um, different techniques, different cognitive techniques to function in these high stress environments and then applied it to the profession of emergency medicine and critical care. And I realized, hey, I do that and I do that and I do that. And it's like, well, now I got names for all this stuff and I can give a lecture about it. So I stole a lot of it, in other words. <laughs> Well, that, that, that's a, you know, it's funny you mentioned that stealing a lot of it. There was um, you were you were ripping on a, a in in Doug's talk. He he references a a TED talk all about how depending on the posture you take, you can actually affect acutely affect the hormones that are expressed. Just being very tall, being very very big, our testosterone is going up, our cortisol is coming down, and 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 we're very feeling very 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 good about ourselves. But there was another TED talk I heard recently that was all about kind of the we're. Uh, or, it was a reconsideration of what kind of what is original means, like this idea that people are inventing things de novo, or out of the blue from nothing, is really probably not happening too much anymore. The idea that you, you that you're not inspired by something else, yeah. or that 
there's someone twiddling away in a lab inventing something purely out of inspiration with no point of reference whatsoever is we think about that as being original, but most of what we consider original is not that at all. That this idea of invention without inspiration just doesn't happen. You're, you're trying to fix something. You've been inspired to fix something or to better your own processes. So I, the fact that you, you just reconfirmed that is, yeah. is really relevant to the talk. Well, I think it applies. Just beforehand, we were talking about your master's thesis mm -hmm. and how it kind of came to fruition at the same time as a paper that was published by five Chinese PhDs yeah, yeah, yeah. on exactly the same topic that you all came to the exact yeah. same conclusion right. at the same moment in time. Right. And I think, you know, throughout history, parallel discovery happens. And it's not because anyone's stealing from anyone yeah. else, yeah. which is what people in the hit field never can yeah, yeah. understand. Right. But um, that we're all thinking and we're thinking about problems and we all have come up through the same era sure. with the same cultural influences and with the same um, data points to operate on so it shouldn't be a surprise that you know parallel discovery does happen right right and and just a total aside uh, it, the the hit the thesis he's talking about all is about resistance training in the brain we'll link to that bigger paper <laughs> also down here as well it's going to be a 14 page linked links fest but Bill, I'm going to kick it over to you. Bill hasn't had his talk yet. Um, no, and I probably should have spoke before, Doug, because mine isn't as heavy. <laughs> <laughs> so this is going to be quite a come down. Uh, you got from, a come down. From, from, yeah, thanks. I thanks guess uh, well, don't bless it. We'll take it up with Anthony. Uh, <laughs> but um, but uh, you, you know, it's it's this will be the second time you've spoken at the 21 convention. Yes, I did 2009. That was 2010 or so. Right, and uh, previously you spoke all about you kind of gave an, a general overview of your congruent exercise. Actually, I, did, I gave the first five chapters <laughs> of congruent exercise <laughs> before I wrote them. Oh, wow. Um, so I he had I'd given a talk earlier in, uh, for Luke Carlson in Minnesota. And I was giving a talk now for Anthony. And um, I didn't want to do the same thing. And I, I'm sure I've seen enough repeats and packaged presentations that I know you can get away with it. But it gives me, it, it, selfishly, it gives me a chance to rethink the material I'm dealing with. Yeah. So, um, so I, read, I, threw my, you know, I threw the previous presentation away and I came up with the, what, what turned into the first five chapters of Congruent Exercise, um, which he very courteously put online uh, as an as a hour and a half YouTube. Yeah. Um, but that is the first five chapters, almost verbatim. <laughs> wow. The only thing, um, um, the only thing I added in the book was the specific exercises and beginning and finished position of the exercises. Yeah. Um, but I, I actually I used the the fact of having to give the presentation to try to re um, to try, try to repackage the material. Like one of the th things you you said to me many years ago was, uh, as a matter of fact. So let me just say, when I first put Moment Arm Exercise out, <clears throat> 2003 or so, Doug, Greg, package. Doug, Greg, Fred Hahn, and a couple of others, I, I sent them the book. We, and none of it, I didn't know, didn't know these guys. I wasn't part of the Super Soul Guild, no. or I wasn't part of any of the formal groups. And Doug went out of his way to call me and said, great book. Uh, you point out a lot of things I, I knew back in my head. I just didn't relate them to what we were doing in the studio. And, and getting, to, getting to my point, you must have really teased the material out. And it's true, because those, those anatomy and biomechanics books are not written for the sake of lifting heavy things in a gym. No. Yeah, I think it would be more accurate to say is that you pointed out things that I was embarrassed <laughs> well. that I didn't work out for myself. I mean, I took anatomy. You mm. know, I mean, I had to memorize all these origins and insertions and function, but I never... And I think it was because I had so much bodybuilding, muscle and fitness, and Nautilus bullshit <laughs> crammed in my head that I could never actually just look at the raw data of the anatomy and the functional anatomy. And I, I really was as embarrassed that it's like, wow, this guy knows his <laughs> shit. I mean, he knows his anatomy, and this makes perfect sense. And why have I been doing this this way this whole time, you know? And, Ironically, the exposure uh, to some of this way back was when I was, you know, going through uh, my graduate work and some of the leveling courses I had to take before that. You know, we're in a kind of a kinesis course, 
Um, and it's sort of like they're going through all of these things and they're saying many, like, you know, here's impingement at 90 degrees of shoulder right. rotation and then the scapula has to turn and all the other stuff. But there's never the following conclusion of, and here's a contraindicated movement for, right. you know, but they, they never go that far. They just sort of stop like, just the facts, ma'am, rather than here's the application of that information. So I was kind of like, you're stopping the game short. Like, like in right. school, they're stopping the right. game short. They're not taking it as far as it could be for applicability, which is... Well, and it's even worse when you get to the various personal training certifications, because I'm not an academic right. guy. I, I don't have the green exercise. Um, I did get NSCA certified twice, and I've been A certified a couple of times. And, and in the, the textbooks, the biomechanics and anatomy sections, they're pretty good, but they don't do that. Right. So they t they they they're pretty good in the front of the book, and then they ignore it. And then they <laughs> ignore it in the back of the book. Yeah. And and every trainer I know who's ever taken those tests, they memorize it to get through the test. Sure. And then, you know, people doing upright rows mm -hmm. and, and various right. various things that are so clearly contraindicated right. from the raw material. Right. Um, so and before we, we, we move on, I just want to say that it was it was Doug, Greg, and um, Fred Hans genuine interest in the material that gave me instant credibility with anybody remotely in interested in HIT, which I've always appreciated. Because yeah. they didn't know me. This was before the days of affiliate arrangements <laughs> and, and phony testimonials and right. phony message board posts. Right. It, it was all genuine interest yeah. on, on their part. It was the cyberpunk days. Yeah. Kind of like, yeah. 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 But it was all genuine interest um, on their part. Uh, uh, you know, Greg Point, well, he called me also, and we got to be very friendly. Um, but he point blank would tell people, buy this book from this guy in New Jersey. Yeah. And uh, Fred um, had a message board at the time that he allowed a lot of space to be given over to discussion of this particular work, um, both pro and con, but overwhelmingly pro. And again, it was, it was, this was before people were manipulating these things. <laughs> you know, you were blatantly paying somebody to yeah. mention my book or put a link up or uh, and that stuff. Yeah, there so wasn't, I, there I wasn't 80 pages that. of copy for this with all of these testimonials. Oh, and, no, 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 no. No, you really had to dig to get to it. I yeah. mean, it was, yeah. yeah. It, so, um, so is this an evolution of your thinking, kind of the talk today, or the, the talk tomorrow about? Uh, the, the, the evolution is in, um, <clears throat> you know, the material is material, okay? Shoulder, spine, and knee, it, it is. It is what it is, period, end of story. But how to present it becomes the issue. So, for instance, in moment arm exercise, I flip through it now and I say, yeah, it's pretty good. But then I realize, wait a minute, I've been lifting weights uh, for over 40 years, and I've been studying this, you know, Nautilus, the bodybuilding from the 70s, and I've got multiple certifications. If I think it's pretty good, it has to be over the head of some 20-year-old who's just trying to figure out what to do in the gym. Right. And feedback from my non-fitness friends was, I, I, you lost me. <laughs> so it took me about 10 years. Well, in between, and in between, I did a few presentations for Bo Raley, and each of those was an attempt at making the material a little more accessible. Hmm. Um, and then almost 10 years later, I came up with the congruent exercise, which I was trying to be a little more topical because I, I did talk about kettlebells. I did talk about various um, functional training. And, um, and then again, I was trying to make it a little more accessible, which it must have worked to a degree b because that has sold dramatically more than moment arm exercise. And part of that is being available on Amazon and being uh, available on Kindle. Um, but so, t so tomorrow, you know, the next thing I, like I did this in reverse. Yeah. You know, I, I, I like moment arm exercise is like the super technical computer guide, right? And then there's, you know, maybe congruent exercise was sort of like the idiot's guide too, <laughs> right? And then hopefully the next one will be the thing you actually buy and people actually read. <laughs> and you actually can see in a bookstore and have some people go, what, you know, what I really hope is that people carry it in the gym yeah. or bring it to their basement where they're working out and flip through the page and say, okay, this is how I do this, okay, I got it. Yeah. I, I, you know, you read, um, you know, Dr. Darden has been very helpful also, but you read, he's been very helpful in, in understanding how to book field works. And you told me a few years ago, unless you're already a celebrity, you're not getting a book deal. And you know what? You look at every pop fitness book, it is the same template. Yeah. Usually like 
you know, a bust shot of whoever the author is. Yep. And then you have a lot of glossy pictures, and then you have a, a chapter on motivation, then you have a chapter on, on diet, and a, month, a million recipes, and then you yeah, got yeah. the picture, the glamour shots of the exercises, right. and then you got the routines. It's the same book. Yeah. Yeah. You, can yeah. just, you just write out the name. Well, you know, that, that worked when Darden wrote the new hit, too. That's almost, that's almost kind of when, when he wrote the new hit, that's right. almost the same template, because it, it was a major, major publisher. It wasn't T Nation or whoever published his last book. It was um, like that. There's a bust on the front. All the model shots. There's a little bit of history of hit. There's all the exercises laid out, some routines, and then like a that, diet. That was at the, the end. third, the, the one he wrote three three books ago. Uh, I think that's right. Yeah, yeah. There's the the, the 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 fat loss, super fat loss solution one that he just had, and then right, the, wrote, the body fat breakthrough, the the, the horizontal old school, one, and yes. then and then the one right before that. Okay. Right. Not just because he's coming tomorrow. Right. But <laughs> but I actually liked. I like Especially that one like all three books. Yeah. Because he's throwing himself in it. He's yeah. not writing from the third person anymore. Right. He's throwing a little behind the scenes stuff that I think all of us suspected, but you didn't really yeah. know with all the sanitized stuff we read in the 70s and 80s. Right. Yeah. Um, I thought that new hit, I will blatantly say, I ripped off the, the look of it for what turns into congruent exercise. Yeah. Because the pictures were clear, yep. there wasn't a lot of clutter, it was bullet points, Here, yep. here's how to do this exercise. And then he had yeah. chapter stuff, right. and so I, I blatantly, you know, oh his designer, <laughs> oh his designer that's something. Um, that, that, that's really great. We'll, we'll, we'll come back to that. We better go to commercial break. We'll be right back. And we're back from commercial. So Doug had a good question for Bill about uh, about his first book about moment arm exercise, which is what was the sticking point for so many people reading the book? Was it physics? Was it physiology? Well, you know, um, first it wasn't, so I'm not a professional writer. So this wasn't an assignment. I didn't have a market in mind. I had injured myself. And this was me working out um, over really a four year stretch, me working out what happened and discovering what I refer to as a disconnect between exercise and biomechanics. And, re, and so basically I rebuilt my own process of working out. And then I realized from all my notes and sketches and diagrams, I said, wait a minute, I have something here. But I didn't know what it was. Yeah. I didn't know if it was a commercial book. I didn't know if it was an academic book. So I just put it together and had it spiral bound because I yeah. didn't know any, you know. I remember getting that book. Yeah. And of all the ones you've written, that's my favorite one. Well, because when it came to me, it like has this little note scrawled on it. It's like, big and iron, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. And like, please read this. Tell me what you think. And I like, read it. I was like, holy shit. Yeah. Well, it was so cool because you were living through your thought process. Right. You were thinking on paper. And I was like, my God, why didn't I ever? Why, why am I so damn stupid? I never well, thought of anything. You know? Not, not well. <laughs> but um, um, Mr. Body by Science. Yeah, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Mr. Emergency Medicine. That's right. That's but right. Um, um, but I, you know, I was working my own things out. Ha had these notes here, but guys around my age who had also studied the Menser and the Nautilus literature from the '70s, every one of us got it right away. Yeah, read it and said, "I know exactly what you're talking about." Right. When you get to our age, the crows start to come home to roost. Shit you did in 1975 right. all of a sudden is, becomes right. a problem and, 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 in 2005. And, when, yeah. you're, and you're, when you're my age, stuff you did this morning will haunt you later tonight. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to wait 20 years. Yeah, man, I just got that wooden roller coaster at Bush Gardens, and See? I'm like, man, I don't feel all that. Yeah. But, uh, but the, um, and what, what, now what was also is, you know, if you, um, if also, everybody our age, with our reading experience, read this and said, boy, you really kind of you know, poked holes in a lot of Nautilus theory. You didn't come out and say it, but it's, it's in between the lines. Yeah. And, and, he, but now, and, and fortunately for me, Ellington Darden got in touch with me when he read it, said, boy, I really liked it, which I was sweating it out because I knew, what <laughs> right, I, yeah. I, knew, I knew where my head was at when I was writing it, but I right. didn't want to write it that way. Right. And he said, I especially like the first five chapters when you talk about the science. Well, the first five chapters is where I, I say, here's what we used to think. Right. And it was pretty much a direct quote here's from the his books. Dogma. Right. I didn't say, I didn't right. say that, but yeah. that's what I led it right up yeah. to. 
Um, so I must have phrased it right, because I'm really not doing this to make enemies. Right. You know, I, right. like I said, that was, yeah. that was strictly working my own thing out. But anyone It was a brave did, book, too, because in that time, I mean, the whole super slow thing was that it's a pretty high peak of religiosity at the mm -hmm. time. It was like, Probably right. It was like, you know, guys, I blew out a bicep tendon doing a super slow curl. Yeah. You know? and, and again, I didn't want to... Um, just in general, I don't want to critique other people's work. Right, but but that is what I was for doing. the first time <laughs> ever. It said, you know, just going slow isn't going to fix everything if the biomechanics aren't I right. I tried not to say that exactly right. that way, but yeah. sure, that's it. That, yeah, I, like I said, because anything I don't, going too slow with the incorrect biomechanics is like drags out the whole process. Well, and might make it more likely, you know. So I, I found though that, for instance, like the NSCA crowd dismissed it. They, they had they had no interest in it. Um, Why is that? Why do they? Because they didn't have the frame of reference of the Nautilus and the hit mm. background, yeah. and and they and they weren't interested. I'm sure in they got bored really quick and just. But they they weren't interested in objectively saying, well, here's what biomechanics says how the shoulder works, so we shouldn't. You know, one thing about the hit influenced community no. is right or wrong, whether I I agree with them individually or not, or butted heads with them individually or not. They do care about this stuff. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, they do. But yeah, they really do. To a fault, but they do care. Yeah. You, you try to engage NSCA people or or ACE people, whatever. They're interested in a lot of them are interested in the trappings of working out, but picking apart. Gee, do you really think you should be putting the shoulder in that position? That, that's not. Yeah. That, that's it's just not on their agenda. It, so. Yeah, it's it's like um, I, I made this point. This is a total aside, but one of the speakers at the or it's not a total aside. I'll bring it around. Dave Asprey, who's spoken at the Twenty One Convention, he had the conference a couple weeks ago, the quant uh, the biohackers conference. And I was trying to explain what a biohacker was, and I finally came up with this pretty little Venn diagram of the quantified self folks up here who won't who won't get out of bed in the morning unless they can track something. Right, like I need to know how many steps I'm going to take, how many bowel movements I'm going to have, and they're going to attempt to put it into a black box and turn it into some sort of like metric of, of uh, how healthy they are, or if they're moving in the right direction, or if they're thinking well. And then there's a whole component that that will get you to speak on on like the notion of, well, number one, any human involved kind of measure is inherently lossy and fuzzy, and you know, a two seconds here, two seconds there. It's like taking doing uh, doing labs of blood. If you let something oxidize just a little longer, it's going to give you a totally different readout. And then there's the life extensionist people who are, who are waiting for the singularity when humans and machines come together <laughs> in one. And they're the least healthy people on planet Earth because they're waiting for capital S science to make capital M magic and, and let them live for eternity. And then you've got the health and fitness folks filling out the final third, which is like the NSCA type people who are like, we like working out. And well, are, what are, are you measuring anything? No, we just like working out. Like it's, it's for its own sake, they enjoy it. And, so you get some people, and the hit would almost be like if you took the quantified self sphere to some degree and overlaid it with the health and fitness folks. So they care about components of, measure, of, of actionable data or tr certain truths, like, mm -hmm. your sh like your shoulder will, you know, you're, you're going to impinge right here. Unless you've had your AC joint sawed off for some reason, you're going to impinge here. Um, and so it's, it's kind of funny that way, though, that, that there are a number of people who they're so wrapped up in the qualitative feel of training that they care nothing for the kind of nuts and bolts of it. Um, well, feel is a very persuasive phenomenon. Um, uh, and I'm going to bring this up tomorrow. You know, I'll, I'll get people say, oh, I did a kettlebell class. It's a great workout, right? <laughs> Why? <laughs> yeah. Why is it a great workout? Well, you, you're breathing heavy, you're sweating, your muscles hurt the next day. All right, I get it. I get it. That is, that is very persuasive. You know, your muscles burn, mm -hmm. you're sore. Yeah, that's, that's come over and wax my car. Yeah, well, <laughs> well, exactly. But exactly. And, there, and there's this huge disconnect between the feel right. and what it means, right. or, or what's yeah. really happening there. Right. And and um, whether it's uh, kettlebell classes or why grip chins? Just feeling the tip of your scapula, dig into your latissimus, and thinking, yeah. oh, that's yeah, from yeah, width. Yeah, right. Okay. Exactly. You know, it's very, kind of the feel in an exercise is very. Um, in it fact, is compelling. In fact, in fact uh, your, 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 your bulldog with a bone question about J-Reps 10 years or so ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Know, what was that? <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. Here it goes, here it goes. Here. I, I can remember it clear as day because it goes like this. Because um, 
Bill's talking about like biomechanics, this and that, and you're interviewing him, and he's telling this really long, kind of compelling piece about this, that, and you get, you're like, that's really, really great. What do you think about J reps? Like, <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then, and then, like, and then it, it kind of because that was the hot thing. Like, like Johnson yeah. had just released the. J Reps Volume One of yeah. three something. I, I forget how many volumes DP went. Um, actually, there is some. So that was funny because because totally tangentially, there is a small amount of literature more recently that that indicates like when a when tissues contract, it's not like everything on that linear path starts sliding right. towards one another. It's almost this portion and then this portion. Not that you can affect the hypertrophy as much as there's this almost regional box car yeah boxcar effect to the sarcomeres. Like the, there's a little bit here. There's a little bit here, there's a little bit here. They're all under tension, but it's sort of like Away. collapse, collapse, collapse. But, but I think it's a, it's a bit of a reach at this point to say, so then that then right. justifies breaking the rep up. Oh, totally. No, I'm, I'm on board with you there. Now, I just think now, it's interesting. Having, that, having said that, though, yeah. J-Reps 21, like, what was Darden's? Uh, stage, you called them stage reps, or, stage reps at one point. No, no. Stage, stage <laughs> yeah. reps, right? And rep old body, half, old, half, yeah. body, old body build yeah. magazines, uh, uh, 21s, yeah. or reps and a half. Whatever the mechanism is, it's very compelling. Sure. Like, because oh, yeah. let's face it, you go stale if you use the same technique. Sure. And so you go stale, and you can get eight reps, and you can't get nine. No. And then instead, the next time you do one and a half reps with that, no. and whoa. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Whoa. That's right. I got that depleted feeling again. That's I'm right. pumped. Holy cow. That's right. Uh, so I, I, you know, not to be anti-science, but it doesn't matter. That's right. It's like it's like it's an interesting the t the t the t yeah, yeah yeah the the feel is very compelling and you know stepping back a second if it keeps you motivated to train great yeah great sure. it, it you know it doesn't I, I, being a trainer not an academic um, I don't feel I don't have to justify everything I do with a direct link to a research you know right. I mean, I have a framework I, I work around, but if it keeps person interested, great. Yep. And doesn't hurt, of course. It's a bit like what Ryan Hall, who's a, a friend of ours who has a facility in, in New Orleans, an exercise physiologist, says when people, how long do I have to do this till you die? Like, right. you know, the, so right. if, yeah, you're going to go stale. You can't, you're not going to stay in the same routine forever. And so picking kind of best, even if benign, like even if it's right. all up here and the, cha the change is so? just for the head, so what? You know, Doug, um, um, you know, you talk about why didn't you think about it? Actually, in, in your uh, bulletin one, you had one line in there about whether you actually, I think it was about whether you actually needed a camp. Yeah. And the line you said was, when you're doing a bench press, if your pectorals are exerting, can, can display less torque as your arms coming together, then doesn't a compound exercise, by definition, Have bear... cam built in, yeah. Yes. <laughs> and I took that and <laughs> kind of ran with it. I'm like, what? Yeah. That was one of the things I, I went... I, I went when I blew my uh, biceps and triceps out, I went back to the NCA biomechanics, and I went back to that line. I reread it. I said, you know, there's something, there's something yeah, there. That, that whole book was, by and large, an embarrassment because it was that stage of training where you're kind of trying something new, and it's like you're watching the tide come in. You measure, and then you measure, and you're like... Oh my God! The whole city's gonna be underwater in a week, <laughs> and then you go write a book about it. You know? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. But I mean, I, that was the first bit of your work I had read because Coach comes in. So Coach uh, John Coleman was my mentor. He was the he won three national championships in American football in Mexico City of all places. A very very interesting guy, and I think he was an assistant coach under Bear Bryant during the Texas A and M days. Um, and 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 he goes, do you know Doug McGuff? I go, no, no, he goes. Here's, here's his book, read it. <laughs> <Yeah>. All right. <laughs> All right. So, so I'm reading the book, and, uh, and the thing was is that there was a sense of excitement, but there was also a sense of, you know, the further you got in the book, it, it was clear that you were, you were recognizing that this was a tide coming in scenario. There was a tonal change in the middle of the book that went from, like when you're talking about doing a leg press with a broken foot. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah and how... And how you could figure out kind of the perfect rep speed based on the fact that you went too fast or too slow, yeah. pain increased. But about five or six seconds, you could mm. kind of suss out that middle ground, which it, which to me is like cracking the yeah. armor, cracking the armor. It's like yeah, starting to see some That was stuff. my first experiment with excommunication, too. Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> back in those days, it was like 10, 10, and it was like, and I'm like, you know, I'm really not seeing any clients that can put forth a good effort and go any slower than seven seconds. Right. Mm -hmm. I just did not seeing it. And then I'm like, all of a sudden I broke my foot racing my bike. I'm like, well, let's find out where force really does become an issue. And it was a lot faster than what was being advertised at the time. And you're kind of like, oh, man. Right. You know, this doesn't fit the paradigm. Well, 
Um, I, it just popped in my head. I got to tell you that moment arm exercise and your discussion of scapulohumeral timing mm -hmm. changed how I reduce shoulder dislocations. Oh wow! And and because you're talking about in the ER. Yeah, mm. your, your shoulder gets dislocated. The humeral head comes out of the glenoid, generally falls forward anterior. And the the popular techniques for doing that are incongruent and use a lot of mechanical force to do it. Huh. And um, if you can get the person comfortable and you can get them to relax all the muscle spasm and you just put them in appropriate scapulohumeral timing, it just, because a shoulder dislocation, it's busy. You saw the video and it's like, oh my God, it's just bat shit in here. And a patient comes in and is like, oh, my shoulder's out. And it's this big muscular guy and you're like, oh crap. You gotta start an IV, you gotta get a monitor, you're gonna have to do conscious sedation, you're gonna have to knock them out and then put it back in. But I'm now about 20, 22 shoulder dislocations under my belt with no sedation, no analgesia, no nothing. Just sit and relax and then just get it in the right scapula, hemorrhal timing and it slips mm. right through so, the So, are you, so are you kind of putting them and, and gradually externally rotating them yep. into the scapular just, plane and just exactly. letting it kind of yeah. fall back on its own? Yeah. Beautiful. <laughs> it's, it's it works. And there's actually a guy that has created a whole, a guy in Australia that's created a whole website, a shoulderdislocation.net. A guy named Cunningham, and it's called the Cunningham Technique now, but it's really the De the, Simone, the De Simone Technique. De Simone Technique. And I'm like, dang, you what? know. We're going to be back from commercial with uh, more exciting news about the De Simone Technique. <laughs> <laughs>And we're back from commercial. So, Doug, am, am I right in kind of describing what you're trying to do? Is um, you, you now have a new website talking about uh, what you call it, fitness medicine? Is that what you've kind of it's been titled on there? <laughs> That's what the web designer That's what made out of it. So, so sorry. So, is is this? Uh, is are you you gradually trying to take on more uh, like consulting type stuff? Yeah, trying to I'm expand. Just, I'm just trying to monetize that sort of activity of a hobby gone wild yeah. a little bit better than. What the body by bodybyscience.net was just to kind of keep fanning the flames of keeping yeah. the book, you know, in the in the sub five thousand range on Amazon because that now results, you know, twice a year a nice little royalty check comes along and and just kind of keeping it alive, you know. I, I just don't want to let it just peter out. And, sure, you know. Um, well, you so that was there, but this is more to engage people in, you know phone consultation and you know if you need help setting up a facility or business advice and doing that sort of thing um, equipment selection you know you've been on a podcast lately so it seems like that might have been helpful I mean yeah. or like getting you know, kind of spreading out and, and yeah I mean you do one of those you got to clear out the email because you know I got the emails scheduling software kind of thing is like okay clear that slate get ready and then a bunch of Phone consults and stuff nice. will come in. That's great. Yeah, you know. that's great. Um, so you know, it's interesting about keeping it alive, though. I was Sky and I were talking last night. There's a franchise. I think it was based in Tennessee or so. Mm -hmm. um, seven minute workout once a week. <laughs> oh God. Uh, <laughs> in a small studio, uh -huh. a piece of equipment where you can do a leg press, a chest press, a row, and then there's like a multi piece huh. computer tracked. With vibration plates, that's part of the seven minutes. Okay. Yeah. And um, so they got your book, yeah. And they're that's trying right. to franchise, you know, basically yeah. your, mo your model. <laughs> your model. That's right. Plus a vibration plate. Like it's Plus like dumb, it's plate, like Dumb right. and Dumber. Where it's like the, yeah. the like you, you can't have a workout in six minutes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> seven minute abs. Uh, that's uh, that's funny. And and it, and it's right. You know, because we're, we're kind of talking about how there are a lot of there seems to be a move towards trying to. Qu I don't know what. There is an element. There's something about a sweaty underground nasty gym that yeah. is just like like a, a lot of. If you've ever trained in a powerlifting gym, it, it could be it could be bad for your back when it's all said and done. But you feel like you're ten times stronger just because of the environment. <laughs> so some, but simultaneously, I get like a clinical. If you're appealing to the public, these people don't know what they're doing. They're dressed appropriately. You know, the, there's there are computer monitors, so I can see how they can sell that seven minute workout idea to a number of people. Well, I guess we'll see. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think uh, we're per, ripe per, for a backlash. Yeah, that's yeah, right. yeah, well, there, there's that, and plus, um, 
Um, but, I, but I don't know that the clinical, you know, I don't know that going to the dentist's office for your workout, yeah. how well that works. Right. I think you got, uh, you know, I think people, consumers still, even though they may say, well, I have to do this for my osteoporosis, I have to do this for my joints, they may say that, but I still think it's got to be, a, it can't be overly clinical experience. Um, you know, my, my, my place looks like somebody's living room. Yeah. Deliberately. I deliberately do not have rubber mats on the floor, floor and cinder block walls. It's deliberately a carpet and some, you know, pictures or whatever on the walls, a paint job, because it, they still have to voluntarily show up, you know, one, two or three times a week. Yeah. And if it's, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah with the dentist, the right. dentist noise and everyone's all buttoned up, I, I, yeah. I, haven't, I haven't seen that work, let's put it yeah. that way. Yeah. I, think, I, think you get, I think the closest you can get is like the, the khakis and like the, the collared shirt. Like you almost look like a golf pro. Which is like, pretty much my attire, yes. Right. And, uh, and it, it, it's, it's funny that you kind of, so do those battle ropes, you still have those battle ropes? I do. Do they tear up your carpet? They don't. Okay. They don't. First, <laughs> first, first of all, no one, first of all, first of all. <laughs> My equipment will never wear out <laughs> because people use it under control. Right. So the battle, I, I looked at the, so much stuff in fitness, the hype is so over the top, you can't help, like again, in the hit influence community, the hype is so over the top, you can't help but really lash out against it. Sure. But there's maybe, you know, one or two valid uses for the, for the piece. Sure. So um, with the ropes, I don't have their people slamming the rope and throwing the rope and, yeah. and all that stuff and playing tug of war with the rope. Huh. They, they do like an alternating sort of a wave. Yeah. So each arm is, is doing this and it's in a rhythm and yeah. I do it for 30 seconds. And you know, the last 10 seconds I tell them go faster. Yeah. So it's like a set. Yeah. And there's no weight pushing back on them. No. So it's a little bit of a metabolic workout for the upper body. Yeah. I don't have to worry about it pushing their, you know, I don't have to worry about whether they go back too far because right. when they stop, the ropes stop. Right. Um, but that's the only thing we use it for. Yeah. One, <laughs> one exercise. Yeah. Yep. Uh, and, and I have a lot of stuff in the studio I have to do one exercise. Yeah, we have a piece like that at our Rosedale facility that it's, uh, we call it the 360. I actually forget who manufactures it at this point. Cause you see, it, it's just that's the 360. That's the 360. It's almost like calling, you know, any tissue Kleenex. You just say that's the 360. <laughs> And it's got three pistons on it, and it's meant to be like used for all this upper body stuff. Yeah. It's just concentric resistance. We kind of use it like it's a self-limiting exercise, like 30 seconds, let's go. And, and then so they're, they're, they're able to exert very high intensity. Motor units start dropping out, and they start slowing down. They, they inherently are self-limited. Nothing's going to fall on them. And it's like, all right, now let's go do the real work. You felt like you've been worked out. Now let's go do a pull down on the ARX. Now let's go do this. It says something for their head at the beginning of the workout. And... and um you know, in all of this stuff too, like again, I wasn't part of Super Slow Guild or anything. If you can fit it in a half hour and it's mm. not harmful, yeah. why not? Yeah, right. You know, um, because as, we, as everyone's come to the same conclusion, a lot of things work. Sure. And you get, uh, Yeah, well, here's the biggest conclusion is everything works. <laughs> a skeletal muscle is the most right. plastic, yeah. adaptive <laughs> tissue that was ever on the face of the earth. Right. That's why there are so many different opinions about how to do it, because it all works because it's adaptive tissue. Well, that, that plasticity, I've always kind of told clients, and you can kind of either confirm or deny what I, what I tell them, I go, this is why most injuries are not muscular. It's like connective tissue in nature or, or the joint itself. It's because the muscle tissue is so plastic, it's rare that like the bicep tore in the middle, right? Yours was, yours was a tendon well, rupture, a tendon. right? It's yeah, it's a tendon, tendon at the tendon. end. Like nobody, yeah, like nobody's right. tearing down the center. Well, some, it's some, no, some, there are, there are pet convulsions. Interesting. Uh, I had a, a conference. I, I say was, nobody, I'm, I'm being slightly uh, exaggerating, but it's rare. Slightly, but uh, powerlifting injuries. You see a yeah. lot of, you see a lot of yeah. where they avulse the pectoral right in the middle. Um, I wonder if that's natural or like supported, like the, the shirts that put them, that give them like an I, elastic I, I power. Don't, but. I don't know, but, but I, I used to work with an orthopedic surgeon who did a talk for me, and he had, um, I forget who it was, it was a power lifter in the uh, early 90s who had a bolst his pectoral, and he had done the surgery. Yeah. So he had powerlifting pictures of him, and he had surgery pictures yeah. of him. Oh, yeah. And it was. Uh, the interesting thing is when you ferret out really what happened with this or that injury, it is usually a lot more about the biomechanics and the position you were in than it is about 
um, exactly the manner in which you were doing it. Sometimes it's a combination of the two, yeah. but you got to get in a pretty bad orientation to really bring that kind of harm on. Well, yeah, yeah you think and, or no? And, you know, I'm, I'm thinking of some of the injuries I'm going to refer to tomorrow. These are so such gross injuries, you know, like guys doing barbell step ups. Like why you would do that, I don't know. Yeah, doing the barbell step up and falling off the bench. Yeah, yeah. Or, or, or scrape in the front of your shin or off scrape on the, the box. Or, yeah. or um, uh, bench pressing and missing and, and crushing their jaw, their larynx, you know, yeah. their throat. Yeah. I mean, these are not even to the level of, gee, was it the joint or was it the muscle? They're just yeah, such gross like, mistakes. Right. Um, that that any that even the most fundamental anatomy or biomechanics should tell you, oh, this is going to be a problem. Be careful here. Yeah. And yet, because because we walk into a gym and touch a barbell or a machine or a kettlebell, all that stuff goes out the window. <laughs> well, it's interesting, too, because there's a level of respect not paid to a lot of exercise. I mean, if you watch the lackadaisical nature in which a lot of these people, even if they're strong guys, lift. Mm. Like like uh, Pavel Satsalin has a, has a saying where he talks about, and I, I wouldn't say it's entirely false, but I mean, where do most of our clients get injured? Away from the gym, doing something that, sh that mm. you're looking at, like something they don't respect. Like, I'm reaching in the back of my car for yeah. my purse, and I pulled my shoulder, you know, and it's yeah. like, well, how, why did this happen? I've lifted all this weight. I go, because you don't lift weight back here in this terrible yeah. compromised yeah. position. Yeah. And you thought you could just lift up your giant ass purse and it would everything would be okay. And, and so there's an element of, if nothing else too that comes out of it is this idea of, of perhaps again to a fault is respecting what you're doing. It, you know, if you're inherently you're slowing down, you're being forced to pay attention to the process a little bit more. And yeah. you increase your margin of error just, especially when you, as you're getting stronger and stronger and stronger, that's definitely a helpful thing. Um, now, then the question becomes, does that even matter in the face of all the weight? If you're really, really strong, as you talk about, you'll work up to some level, then your joints start hurting, you gotta back off and do it all over, and kind of figure out that middle ground, which is kind of what led you into writing um, the Body Blade book that... Right, that went nowhere. That went nowhere, but it's still a lot of good ideas out of that. It was, it was, it was a little too far ahead. Yeah. <laughs> a little too, a little too far ahead because I wrote stuff about the body blade. I included the rope in there, right. and again, a couple of things. You know, e each of these devices they're not complete, one hundred percent useless. Right. There's one or two things they do really well. Right. Um, and and frankly, wanting to figure out what those one or two things are is really a marketing call on my part. Yeah. Because I when I opened up, I had just weight training machines, just uh -huh. nitro and dumbbells and such, and invariably, someone would come in. Oh, do you have a treadmill, and I would launch into the typical hit response to that yeah. question. Gla yeah. Eyes glaze over. Lost Choom, customer. Gone. Yeah. So I said, okay, this is not good, a good idea. So I got a handful of cardio ergometers, and then oh, do you have functional training equipment? No, but Choom, gone. So finally, I said, okay, forget this. Yeah. So now I have, you know, I have a Bosu, I have a body blade, I have ropes, I have a of everything. Yeah. So now the answer to the question is yes, I have it. Yes, I have it. Yes, I have yeah. it. We're going to do it the way I, I, I decide we're going to do it. Right. But yes, I have it. Yeah. And now it's no longer a thing. So that really stems from a, like a, a marketing concern. Because yeah. um, I never thought that, that that hit approach of giving the prospective client a lecture, why yeah. what they just asked is stupid. I didn't think that was a winner. Mm. <laughs> I, didn't think, I just didn't, intuitively, it didn't work for me. Yeah. It's, a, it's interesting. I, I always kind of taken the stance of like, you know, you don't go into a steakhouse asking for pizza. I, I, I've used that analogy many times. Right, right, right. So, but, I, but at the times. same time, I get your point where if it's a situation of, because when I worked at Champions all those years ago, invariably the people paying for personal training, what would they do? They'd come in, they'd grab their silly blue towel, and they'd get on a, on a, on a bike or on a treadmill and just do it until coach is ready to train them. Like, it was, it was almost like getting up and brushing their teeth in the morning. Like, it was mm -hmm. the thing that they had to do before they worked out. Um, well, and then when you remove some treadmills, yeah, all of a sudden they were like, they, could, they knew it didn't do anything for them. They knew yeah. it wasn't a real workout, but all of a sudden they were just like, but where did they go? Why, why can't I do them anymore? Like, it was just some weird twitch in the back of their head. Yeah, in commercial places like that, you always, there's just so much ritualized behavior going on. And I think a lot of people do it just because it's so imbued into our public consciousness that that's a good thing to do. It's like recycling. It's like, but, you know, <laughs> why is that good? Right. But, you know, um, I, I think... It doesn't have right. right. <laughs> you know, and I was yeah, just like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, it's all nice. It makes me feel good. And yeah, yeah. that's what I'm going to do.
Well, that, that's funny too because I was I was floating that question to when I was selling the ARX. Someone was like, I, I really like doing my cardio. I go, well, why do you have to do cardio? Because I have to do cardio. Like it's right. like, what's the zeitgeist behind it? And finally, her husband's like, she likes she likes doing stuff with her friends. I go, oh, okay, that's cool. You can use this and do more of that. Like, right. <laughs> like, like as soon as I understood why she wanted to do it. See, and I, and I wouldn't even bother picking at the question. Yeah. I, 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 you know, I'm not, I'm, I'm You're so I, I, I wouldn't even butt heads on the question. Yeah. You know. Oh, I was just trying to find her motivation, why you she know. thought that she needed to do that. And, and we're in Austin, fortunately. People are going to go out and do that anyway. So right. my whole thing is like, dude, this is foundational strength. You're building right, the right, strongest right. damn foundation you can. Go do whatever you want with it. Not like, everybody's so lucky to have that, though, that infrastructure for that. Like in, uh, in New York, in health clubs, yeah. you, would, you would coach, be ready for when the person asks if you have a pool. Because huh. invariably the person, it's, it's very interesting, whether it's New York Health Clubs or even I find it in the studio, even though people want to make a change in their own behalf, this change, starting working out, is going to improve their life. It's going to be better for them. But it's still a change to the status quo. Yeah. And so they look for, and I'm, I'm deviating into sales think or marketing think, but they look for any reason not to upset the status quo. So people would come in and say, uh, do you have a pool? And if he didn't, oh, thank you, I really wanted a pool. And so one sales guy knew so said, he turned around to him and said, they were off the hook. Yeah. That's right, they don't have to make this change. Right. And so one sales guy turned around and told everybody to listen. Ask him, oh, how much do you swim? And then most of them were going to say, oh, I don't swim. I just thought it would be nice <laughs> to do. Like and then he can steer it the way nice. he wants. Nice. Yeah. Um, so it's very interesting that, that even though this is, first of all, I don't think you have to convince any consumer that there are benefits to exercising regularly. Whatever, whatever the, form, yeah. the modality is. You don't have to convince them. They know. But it's still a change in routine. Yeah. Uh, or, or, or their comfort level. Even though it's an unhealthy comfort level and it's only going to benefit them, any excuse. Oh, do you have BOSU? No. Oh. Oh, well, you don't really need, I really want to work on a bolster. Um, uh, I used to find people would come up and they would blurt out, what does it cost? And I would watch a reception and say, it costs $40 a session. Oh, thank you. Yeah. I'm like, hmm, something's, there's something, something's yeah. wrong here. So one day, someone comes up, what does it cost? And I, you know, boom, boom. It's not kind of <laughs> I, move, I say, oh, let me get you a fee schedule. Have you worked with a trainer before? And I wasn't being you know, deceitful. I was just trying to get, it, get past that question. I was going to give it to right. what it costs. Because buried in the question is getting off the hook. Right. Like yes. we talked about before. Yes. Yeah. Have you worked with a trainer before? And invariably, that got the person talking about whether they did or they didn't and what problems they were having. And now the question in their head, you can almost see the gears turn, was can I afford this to how can I afford this? Yeah. Again, because you know what? They don't know the vocabulary to say, how's this going to help me? So they fall back on, what does this cost? Because it's an easy no, and they don't have to make any changes. Yeah, that's right. We're going to take a quick commercial break. We'll be right back. We're back from that commercial break. So we're hit, guys, and inadvertently, kind of the whole rest of the industry is now latched onto high intensity in some form or fashion as maybe defined differently than we would use it, but they're definitely calling it that. Rather than, than trying to find out, you know, how little can they work, they're trying to, and then now the pendulum has swing totally in the opposite direction. How much hard work can we do? Not just work, but how much really ridiculous hard work, the CrossFit's, the Insanities, these, these things. Um, why do you think all of a sudden work, hard work is in vogue? <laughs> I mean, this is just this is kind of brain sort of picking out a lot. Why all of a sudden, those of us who've been attempting to just work really, really hard for a really long time, now all of a sudden everybody else wants to work really, really hard too, even if they're defining it differently. Bill, I don't know. I, I don't. I just can't. I, I, I want to think there's a cultural zeitgeist, but I don't think there is. No, I think it's just a, a, the fetish nature of the exercise industry. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's just its turn. Yeah. The next thing. It's yeah. just its turn. Um, now, in the literature side of things, the pendulum is really swung towards high intensity and in finding out how brief yeah. and what the minimal effective dose is. So, in the in the scientific field, they're really swinging our way and they've right. swung so far our way I'm just waiting for the, yeah, to go the back. backlash yeah. and the pendulum to swing right. in the other direction. Why all the hard, um, I think a lot of it probably spawns out of CrossFit that's done a beautiful job of tapping into the, the 30 to 40 year old yuppie mentality of Johnny Quest and you know 
be John Best. They're not going to know what Johnny Quest is. No, uh, they're not. It can't be that. Can't, that, <laughs> that can't be it. That can't be it. Uh, what's it, it's a, it's a, but just that whole, you know, I'm. This, I'm you know, special you know, forces kind of guy. Special right. forces. Right. That's right. funny because right. you know Erwan right. Lacour with his with his move net idea. I think he actually has something there as far as trying to change physical education yeah. in America or in anywhere for that matter. Because one of the things I picked up in graduate school is really interesting. Was this idea of not like you know being strong to be being good enough in your body to be useful in other things rather than just being a right. walking sculpture. Um, and actually, in the physical education literature, there's a backlash against like sports-based physical education because kids can opt out so early and they learn nothing about how to move. Yeah, they don't even learn the game because if they can get tagged out the first thing, they're not comfortable in their body. Mean, they're just out. Big movement in the '50s and '60s that was very much like move nat. Yeah. In elementary school physical education, I mean, I remember when I was in middle school, they even had a book about it called Toughen Up. <laughs> <laughs> and it was all these kids, you know, monkey bars and doing the human yeah. flag and all this That's cool. sort of stuff. <laughs> Um, Teaching the human flag to kids. Yeah. That's crazy. And um, that just gradually fell out of vogue, and now... Well, God, I can't imagine. I was talking, I mean, it was in, it was in you know, my talk earlier when I was saying how you know, we're in a high stimulating, highly stimulating environment, and so these kids are always clicking the dopamine button. It's no surprise that boys sit in class and they just go, oh my God, it is so yeah. boring. Um, but I can remember, you know, 15 minutes, 15 minutes of recess, twice, a, you know, two, you had your lunch recess and you had right. like two intermittent, I was eight, nine years old, 15 minute recess. I go out, scream like a kid, run around, for, and I could sit for the next two hours and pay attention. Yeah. Like that was all it took. And it's it just, you know, I, I just, uh, hopefully it swings back in that other direction. Well, you know, when I was a kid, um, we had the president's physical fitness test twice a year. Mm -hmm. yeah. That still existed when I Does was in really? like, when I was in high school. Yeah, but I, I haven't heard anything of it now. They actually, in my kids' school, they had a presidential fitness award thing. Mm. Last year, they did away with it mm. because it was you know encouraging competitivism and wasn't fair to the kids that weren't as athletic, and in turn, that was discouraging the less athletic kids from. Participate How do you tease of, out that data and be like, clearly it was the presidential yeah. fitness program that made this kid get a D in math, you know? Well, there's no data there's to no it. Data. It's just a, you know, it's uh, just now a the, the political correctness gone wild. The uh, high schools in, in my town, part of their gym, they have exercise machines, cardio machines, so it is more fitness-based than sports-based. Nice. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, it's just like it's just like corporate fitness, right? If the top guy is a fitness guy, they can justify the corporate fitness center. Right. If the th that guy top guy leaves and the accounts come in, it's gone. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's gone. What are we using the square footage for? Uh -uh. Get rid of it. Right. Yeah. So it's all, it's, it's, it's the top guy's you know uh, uh, preference, I guess. Well, you, you know, it, it's it's funny. Kind of, you, you even see that in places you think should have should actually be on board with this. Like we were as a, as a company trying to get in with uh, St. David's a Hospital in, in, in Austin there. And we're, and we're trying and they built this beautiful like 2,000 square foot like fitness center for their, for their people, kind of adjunctive to their McKinsey Physical Therapy Clinic. And the thing's like a cobweb. It's like, like nobody's <laughs> using it at the rate that, that they thought it would be used. Yeah. And, it, and it's, it always blows my mind how many times I'm driving across town and I drive past one of the hospitals, and all the nurses are outside smoking. Oh yeah, just like a litany. And and then there and then there's the guy, of course, with who's who's drug his IV out too, and he's out there smoking. Yeah, <laughs> and it's just like I, I don't know. One of the things that I came away with from my graduate education about health education is like. You can't just rationally present things to people. You can't just be like, here right. is the interpersonal, process. like like D.A.R.E., D.A.R.E. to keep kids off drugs doesn't. Like drop the drop the car from the crane. Now I remember what I was going to talk about. Here we go. Drop the car from the crane and it crashes. Like this is what happens if you're if you're high and you get in a car wreck and all the kids go, cool. Yeah. You know? <laughs> they, don't, they don't get excited, they don't get excited about that. And health and fitness simultaneously, you have a whole slew of people who need it and they can't be reached rationally. They need like structural changes to their, to their lifestyle, or they need um, some amount of some amount of I'm going to say com community intervention is perhaps too strong a word, but facilitate being able to facilitate getting over some of those hurdle excuses like you're talking about in a marketing right. sense. But we in the fitness industry kind of have well, not we necessarily in this room, but the fitness industry in general they have the sort of highest shiniest fruit. I use this analogy. I go if you're under an apple tree and you're hungry, 
what do you do? You reach up and you grab an apple. But if you're in the fitness industry, what do you do? You try to climb to the top of the tree and get that apple. Like inherently, it becomes this incredibly complex thing, overly complex thing, right out of the gate for so many people. And if they can start it, it's inherently unsustainable. They crash, they never go back. This is the New Year's resolution cycle. Well, and this is what we talked about eight years ago, ten years or so yeah, ago, yeah. which was where where hit, if it is a phenomenon, say, dropped the ball was by emphasizing how hard and how brutal the workout yeah. was and how Puking big you're going to get and how efficient. And, <laughs> and, and, but that wasn't what the general public, that, that wasn't appealing to the general public. The general public would have found appealing half hour, once or twice a week. Right. That, you know, sure. you know the real, the real, Go do all this other real stuff you'd basics, rather be doing. But the real, yes, yeah, yeah. yes. Yeah. The but, early Nautilus marketing, and I don't even know if it was marketing at the time, was look how efficient we made strength training so they have more time to go practice, go do your martial arts, go do your sports. And then somehow it got, it got turned into... You know, and it really seemed to succeed in spite of itself. Because I don't know if it was like this for the Nautilus Fitness Centers for you, like it was for me back in the mid 70s when they just yeah, blew yeah, up yeah. everywhere. But what you got from the community that was just clamoring, like standing yep. in line yep. in the morning to get in, yes, yes. <laughs> it was like a Nautilus Center was like Studio 54 or something. You know, it was like a right. big dude with a velvet rope just to get in kind <laughs> but of that, thing. But that was genuine though. That wasn't manufactured like nowadays. Right. But it, but it didn't come out of their marketing. It came in spite of their marketing. It was yes, just like, oh, yes, these yes, things yes. are cool looking and it's right. different and all the, all the beautiful people are doing it, so everyone wants to do it. Which had nothing to do with their actual marketing approach. It just, right. it happened, just happened organically. Just, and you think about how much Arthur made in spite of the fact he didn't like have like non-competes with the people buying his equipment or like, like the, 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 the Darden could talk more about this, but like he'd sell these lines of equipment and it was like the agreement was like two lines. It was like... Yeah. Uh, it, 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 it was a way the, the, the pe people could get out of it in in a very reasonable way and go off and somehow not do the Nautilus method. You know, that, that whole thing, I think, my opinion is, it was a black swan. It was a magical time and place no. mixed in with, um, you know, a handful of geeks like us that were reading all the magazines and yeah. frustrated with what our results were. Yeah. And the whole Casey Vieter thing, I mean, just... In the personality, it was just really a unique thing, yeah. and um, ever since then, people have been trying to recreate it. I don't think the circumstances will ever be right. there for right. it right. to happen. You know. Well, well, and, and you know, just there's so much information that you can have access to now that the ability to be paralyzed by analysis in that black swan instance is because you have a strong personality, a very unique piece of equipment that. Though he he wasn't reinventing the wheel per se. I mean, who was it, Xander with the mm -hmm. old old resistance training equipment in the late 1800s? I mean, he wasn't reinventing the wheel. It's like paleo as a movement is not reinventing anything. I mean, you know, Graham, maker of the Graham cracker back in the turn of the 1800s with health food, and then I'm forgetting the name of some of the guys in the late 1800s with these like full on. You're gonna you know be barefoot. You're gonna be naked. You're gonna be training. Yeah, yeah. Bernard McFadden. Yeah, Bernard right, McFadden. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. That's right. The lion. And so that's exactly right. Who'd go off into the woods and he'd bury his cash? Well, who, who's, who's uh, physical culture city is a town away from where my studio is. He lived to be 87. I mean, he, yeah. he totally could be luck, but that's, you know, of the time, that's a really long lifespan. Yeah. Now, you know, see, that brings up an interesting thing because uh, the Xander machines were late, late uh, 1800s. Right. Okay. And, um, and then World War I pretty much destroyed most of them. And so you have few, few uh, survived, but may, they were predominantly in Europe. World War I destroyed most of them, mo most of the work. Mm -hmm. um, but I got some, uh, um, you know, reprinted books from the time. Yeah. And the same arguments, Astounding, free, isn't free it? weights versus machines, body weight exercises versus machine exercises, it's the same arguments from the late 1800s to now. It's a 150-year-old argument. Yeah. And Xander's stuff, as far as biomechanics physiology goes, he's, it's right there. Yeah. Like Jones said, if I knew about the other equipment, I would save myself a lot of time. Yeah. Yeah. Moment arm exercise, I worked out the whole thing about the overlapping torque. Mm. It's, it's there. <laughs> it's there. He talks about Swan's Law and how muscle torque varies yeah. over the range of a joint. And then he talks about varying the resistance by where it is on the lever. And I was like, this is unbelievable. And the same, it's the same argument from then. But even more so impressive when you read his stuff was how prescient he was in terms of 
um, realizing the public health implications mm -hmm. and the effects it had on mitigating against disease and yeah. um, well, well, his advertising at the time again, some of the stuff I find online, it's all health, you know, relieve these health conditions. Yes, it's all it's all that. Now, now in fairness, though, he also had massage machines and tapping machines, yeah. and and ro body rolling machines. Right. Yeah. Which. I don't know about. Yeah, that's right. That's <laughs> I, right. I, 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 I don't know. But it might have felt good. It was a way for him to quantify, because one, one of his arguments was, and, and it was an argument in the sense that we have these arguments today. It was more, like, there was more of an acceptance by the manual gymnastics people of his work. It, it was like it was like an acceptance of each other's work, but just you know. I'm gonna do what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna do what I'm gonna do. But yeah, yeah. so they, they published in each other's stuff. Um, but his thing was, look, if you're gonna have a, a, a person massage someone or do a manual resistance, that person's fatigue is gonna interfere with your, how you chart that person's progress. Right. Right. The person delivering the massage, whereas if you use a machine, you're quantifying what the massage is. Right. Or, or the, the right. resistance. Well, and that makes sense to the physical culture kind of wars of Europe of the time. Like, and, and, and invariably, they all had a massage component. They all <laughs> had, which is the weirdest thing. So, so late 1800s, you had, the Czech method, the Swedish method, where we get Swedish massage, mm -hmm. and it was almost like physical culture Boy Scouts at a nationalist <laughs> level. It, it was really kind of strange, but at the same time, we still do some of that stuff today. There's a great uh, web article from I think he's an engineer or scientist. And XKCD is the uh, is the web comic, and he the the comic title I think is like the the inevitable march of time, and it's. And it's arguments from 150 years ago about how nobody sits down to write a letter anymore, all communication's entirely <laughs> too fast, kids aren't listening to their parents. It's the same argument for 150 right. years about yeah. what we say about like text messaging now. Yeah. So, uh, and with the inevitable march of time, sort of as it is, we, we've come to the end of our hour. I hope you all have enjoyed it. Uh, Doug McGuff, we've got this guy over here who's told us all about wonderful, wonderful things. No, Bill Simo, of course I know who you are. <laughs> but but it, it, think about all, all you've learned today and all the, all the, the lessons, and you follow some of the links, dig even deeper, and I think you'll, uh, you'll come to appreciate even more of what these two have been able to tell you today. Take care. <laughs>